Hello, and welcome to another Sunday School Lesson Review broadcast for Sunday, November the 12th, 2023. The lesson review is taken from 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, verses 2 through 5, verses 14 through 18, verses 26 through 27, and 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, verses 13 through 15. The title of the lesson is David's Sin and Punishment. I am your host for this lesson, Minister William Gadsden. I greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that enables us to get the Word of God out to you, the listening public. We originate from the Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church located in the Fort uh, in the Fort, in the Colleen, that is, Fort Cavazos, Texas area. Our address is 4201 Zephyr Road, Colleen, Texas, 76543. You can reach us by telephone at area code 254-680-4378. But if you prefer to reach us online, our website is www.greaterpeace.com. You can also communicate with us by email. Our email address is greaterpeacemc at peoplepc.com. Now, we at Greater Peace provide a variety of services for your Christian growth. A complete schedule of services and activities can be viewed on our website. So please join us in extending God's kingdom here on earth. Again, I am your host for this lesson, Minister William Gadsden. And I thank God for you supporting this ministry. Now let us pray before beginning our Sunday School lesson. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, praise you, ask that you continue to be my guide in all that I do. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, Lord, being my guide as I go through these lessons. I thank you for those that are listening. And Lord, just help these lessons to help us all to grow so that we have a, a lesson that we can talk about or a story that we can talk about, about you and your saving grace. Lord, I thank you and I praise you and ask that you continue to go with me, especially in this particular lesson, as we go forward in this lesson. This is my prayer and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's get started with the introduction to David's sin and punishment. Now, i uh, in a previous lesson, I mentioned that Uriah the Hittite was a foreigner serving in Israel's army. Now, chapter 10 of Genesis lists the generation of the sons of Noah after the flood. Now, history records the Hittites as the descendants of Heth. Was, he was basically uh, a, a son, grandson of uh, Noah, who was the son of Canaan. As is witnessed in Genesis, Genesis, the 10th chapter, verse 15, and Genesis, the 15th chapter, verse 20, which lists the inhabitants of the promised land that Noah's descendants inhabited after the flood, and among them were, was, were the Hittites. But Uriah was one of the 30 or so val valiant men in David's army. Uriah is a Hebrew name. And Uriah was not born a Hebrew. He, well, he must have, been, have changed his religion, religious affiliation. His name reflects a belief in the God of Israel because his name means light of Yahweh or flame of God. Now, when David became king, Uriah, even though he was not a Jew, moved to Jerusalem and settled down with a Jewish wife, but he was still a part of David's army under Joab the general of David's army. Now, the battles battles in those days, basically, they had a starting date. They usually didn't occur during the fall or during the winter. They went until spring. And battles with one enemy usually occurred during the spring of the year. And this was the case with Israel's fight, with Israel's fight against the children of Ammon. But David did not accompany the army to war this time. Possibly he wanted to rest and enjoy his new palace that had been built. What David did when he awoke from sleep was go on to the roof of his house, his palace that is, and as he walked around the, on the roof, he saw a woman taking a bath on her roof. David saw that she was beautiful and wanted to know more about her. He inquired about the woman and was told she was a wife of Uriah the Hittite. What follows demonstrate the power of lust that overcomes every man as it did Eve 
in the Garden of Eden when Satan tempted her. But this subject matter is a woman and not the fruit of a tree. David saw her naked and his lust for her was be beginning to be up was the beginning of a dreadful sin that caused many problems for David throughout his life after this event. David inquired about the woman and was told she was a wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now the story that unfolds after David saw her taking a bath and he forgot the following things. He forgot that she was a wife of one of his valiant men that he had uh, he was acquainted with. Also, Second Samuel the twenty third uh, chapter says lists all the valiant men that was, were part of David's army, and Uriah the Hittite is listed as one of the val those valiant men in Second Samuel verse uh, chapter twenty three verse thirty nine. Now, knowing this about Bathsheba, David nevertheless lusted for her. And this goes to show that David paid no attention to the commandments that said he was not to commit adultery as well as not covet his neighbor's wife. Marriage was to be held as a sacred honor and no one was to commit adultery with a married woman or a single woman for that matter. Now James, the fourth chapter, verse two in the NIV version addresses the situation David encountered. It says, your desire, you desire that is, but you do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. It's kind of some words that I think we can all look at and attest to. One should bear in mind that scripture states that David was a man after God's heart. Nevertheless, when lust gains control, all over uh, all other truths have no effect on a man. David turned on a man that was loyal to him and was married to the woman that he was lusting after. Now, no Christian today should believe he would act differently when faced with this situation with David. The book of James chapter 1 verse 15 says the following. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And you can see that in our lesson today. Um, David had a son, Ill, basically, but he didn't live. Now, if one is to conquer lust, the individual must be spiritually minded and not allow lust to take hold of a given situation. We all know that lust basically happens, but we have to have, be in control by asking the Holy Spirit to guide us and be help us to be aware of the situations we're getting ourselves into if we can and we allow lust to take hold. Now this can only be done before the lustful event occurs because as James says, after the desire is conceived it gives birth to sin and lust takes hold of the situation. Lust does not respect friends, family, or God for that matter. If you look at David, he lusted after Bathsheba. Friends didn't matter. It, basically, Uriah, Uriah was basically working in his army and David was familiar with him because he was one of his valiant men. Family doesn't matter. David didn't care about his family, what they knew. He, want, he wanted to hide it more than anything else. Or it didn't really matter what God, for that matter, thought because lust takes control of the body if we allow it to do that. Now, this is the end of my introduction, so let's get started with our Sunday School lesson. The lesson title is David's Sin and Punishment. The lesson text is taken from 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, verses 2 through 5, the fourth, yeah, verses 14 through 18, verses 26 through 27 of the 2 Samuel 11 chapter. And then we change chapters and go to chapter 12, verses 13 through 15. The golden text is... Second Samuel 12, verse 12, 12, 9. And it reads, um, Well, I don't have it right now, so I, I guess I have to give it to you later on. I, I didn't put it in. I forgot to put it in there when I typed it in. Okay, the lesson outlines are David's adultery. That's Second Samuel 11, chapter, verses 2 through 5. David's crime, 
2 Samuel 11th chapter, verses 14 through 18. David's presumption, uh, 2 Samuel. Um, Uh, 26 verses 26 through 27, David's repentance, 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, verses 13 through 15. Now, let's get inside with our lesson, David's adultery, 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, verses 2 through 5. Verse 2 reads, And it came to pass in an in eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked about the roof of, his king, of the king's house. And from the roof of roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. David had just rose from sleep in his bed and decided to take a walk on the roof of his palace. Now the roof was a common place to sit and relax in the evening during the, this age. Now temptation took center stage as David saw the, a woman bathing on her roof, and he immediately lusted for the woman. And verse 3 says, And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eli Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David wanted to know who the woman was. And some theologians say David initially wanted information on her marital status. Was she married or was she a single woman? David was told that she was the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. However, when lust in a man starts, it rarely ends in happiness. David's son Ammon, Amnon that is, enticed his sister Tamar to have sex with him, incest. And after treating Tamar very, after the sexual act, he treated, treated her, his sister, very badly. And upon hearing this event, David was not happy. And Absalom's other son had his servants murder Amnon. So it can be seen that basically all of these things happen after all of this happened with David after his uh, lust for Bathsheba. Now, the fact that she was married to a friend did not seem to detour, detour David from lusting after her. Verse 4 says, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and she lay with him, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. David now sends messengers to Bathsheba, and she came to the palace of David, and she slept with David. Bathsheba was bathing after the end of her menstrual cycle, and that is where David saw her. Now, some noted theologians think Bathsheba was partly to blame for this event because she was bathing out on the rooftop of her house where others could see her. But one has to consider the notoriety of David and he, and he is also king. And she may have felt she had no choice but to give in to David's desires because he was king after all. And he had control of basically the people. And he could have caused Trump problems for her. Verse 5 says, And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now after the event with David, Bathsheba discovered she was with child and informed David. David set up a plan he thought would ensure that the child would be considered as Uriah's child after hearing Bathsheba was pregnant. He sent for Uriah under the pretense of wanting an update on how the war was going. Now, after speaking with Uriah about the war, David tried two times to have Uriah go to his house and sleep with his wife. But each time, Uriah basically slept with outside David's gate with the servants. He didn't go to his own house. He said that his he didn't feel right going to her home and be with his wife when all of his friends, the ark and everything, was out in the field. And he didn't want to go there. That was the first time. And so David tried another trick to get him to go there. He got him drunk. But after he came back, after he let him go, he went straight back to the place he was before. He didn't go home. And so David was probably upset. And he says, well, now I got to come up with a second plan. So David tried, uh, basically came to plan in his mind to remove all doubt that the child Bathsheba was carrying was Uriah's. 
But on two occasions of trying to get Uriah to go to his wife failed, David had Uriah deliver a letter to Joab, the commander of the Israeli army. This letter was basically telling Joab to, to basically have him murdered. Now, David's crime, 2 Samuel 11, chapter, verses 14 through 18. Verse 14 says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. This letter instructed Joab to have Uriah placed at the front of the line during battle, during a battle. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. Joab was to instruct the mighty men surrounding Uriah during battle to move away from him during the battle. Now, once Uriah was left alone by himself, he would be an e a prime target for anyone desiring to kill him. Consider that what would happen if you were out hunting for an animal or something and that animal just stood there and he was nobody else was around him. You would have a clear shot at it. This is what happened to Uriah. Now, verses 16 through 17 read, And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah into, unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out, this is the city that they were besieging, and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also, because he basically went out with the valiant men, but when he got out to the front of the battle, in the, bat in the middle of the battle, Joab instructed the men from David's word to basically move away from him, just leave him out there in the middle of nowhere. And he died doing that way. So the men of the city Israel was fighting came out, to the, out of the city to fight with Israel. Uriah had been placed in front of the battle line, and when the battle started, the men around him, as I said, moved away from him and when the mighty men moved away from Uriah, he was killed during the battle because when the mighty men moved away from around Uriah, he was a prime target all by himself for the killing. And he and other men of Israel died that day. And then verse 18 says, Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. Concerning the war. And Joab now sent David a message describing the war and that you, you, Uriah the Hittite was dead. Then we get to David's presumption. 2 Samuel 11th chapter, verses 26 through 27. And it reads, And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. Now Bathsheba mourned for Uriah, her husband. Probably the mourning that she did probably lasted about seven days. Uh, that was typical for those to that type of lesson. Now if you're more important, you might mourn for 30 days. So when the morning was uh, passed, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David did had done dis had, had David had done displeased the Lord. You see David had killed Goliath in public, but him with, with, with but him but, but him causing the death of Uriah, he wanted to be kept a secret, as secret as possible. He didn't want anybody to know about him killing Uriah. So to avoid all Jerusalem discovering that Bathsheba was with child, it had to be kept a secret because all of David's servants knew that Uriah did not go home to be with his wife while he was in Jerusalem. And also, he had sent people to fetch uh, uh, Bathsheba, so those people knew about it. So... Not everybody was going to keep that secret and it would come out sooner or later. What's done in the dark will come out to the light sooner or later. So David had to marry her as soon as possible to avoid the truth being told. So after she, her mourning period, which is probably as short as possible as we wanted it, Bathsheba gave birth to a son. But he did not, be, he did not live because the Lord was displeased with what David had done. Then we get to David's repentance. Second Samuel, the twelfth chapter, verses thirteen through fifteen, and third, verse thirteen reads: And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sins; thou shalt not die. You see, if 
to commit adultery in this nature, especially murder, it requires you to be stoning. And, but uh, David admitted that uh, he had done that and he was ready for his punishment. But uh, Nathan comforted him and said that God would not cause him to die. He would not die. So God sent the prophet Nathan to tell David a story about a rich man with many sheep and candles. And a, he had a visitor to come visit him and he didn't want to kill any of his own sheep for, a vi for his visiting friend. So he took the lamb of the poor man that had one sheep and killed it for his friend. To be basically so that he would have something to eat. Now he had thousands of sheep probably, but he, he chose to take the one man. Now this is a story that uh, God, I'm sure, had directed Nathan to tell David. When David heard the story, he was angered and even suggested that this man should be killed. Now, fundamentally, the rich man's crime involved abuse of power. However, David was doing the same thing as well. And however, when Nathan told David, thou art the man, David realized that he must die for what he had done. But Nathan reassured him that he would not die because the Lord had put away his sin but the child would die. And verse 14 says, How be it, because by that this deed thou hast given great occasions to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, and to blaspheme, the child also has that is born unto thee shall surely die. So one death was going to happen. If it wasn't going to be David, it was going to be the child's. Now Nathan said that God would forgive David for his sins, but the son would not live but die. That is the son that Bathsheba bore. That who was David's. Why did God say the child would die, you might ask? God knew that what David had did with Bathsheba would haunt the child during his lifetime. And this would cause many to blaspheme God because of David's sin that actually should have resulted in David's death. Now, to avoid creating a cause of, for blasphemy concerning God's name, God decided to end the life of the child so the child would not have to suffer and the gossip around town would basically cease because somebody knew the situation with uh, uh, Bathsheba and David and that was probably not going to be kept secret because what was done in the dark would sooner or later come to the light. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick, and he died. So let's go home, left to go home, and that is Nathan left to go home, but at this time God struck the child dead. Now David had been mourning the child and praying to God, uh, basically he was flat on the ground, and he was praying to the Lord to not take the, the child's life. But God took the child's life afterwards. David would not eat. He was just basically there in the house and everybody was trying to get him to eat, but he wouldn't eat during, while the child was in, in basically alive. But when the child died, then David basically uh, just got up and ate and everything. So people were awestruck. They said, why is he doing this now? And David said, while the child was alive, I prayed that the Lord would save him. But now that he's dead, there's nothing I can do. So I'm just going on with my life. So prior to the child's death, David mourned for the child and wanted God to let the child live, but it was not to be so. So this is my this my Christian friends is the essence of the Sunday school lesson for this week. I hope something has been said that will help you in your understanding of God's word. Now let us close in prayer. Lord, I thank you, praise you. I thank you for those that are listening, as I always say, and I do indeed thank them you for having them listen to this Lord not because of me but because this is your word Lord and this is a ministry that you have given me and this is a responsibility I take on sincerely and I want to give the word the way it is plain and simple I don't want to add anything to it I just want to give it to it the way it is said I thank you for going allowing me to do that and continue to go with me if it be thy will I ask this in Jesus name amen